Hey there, YouTube, brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for fellowshipping with me again in this ministry. Uh, Brother Brooks here to explain and teach whatever the Holy Spirit teaches me that I share with you for the edification of the church, for comfort and exhortation that many will come to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, King of Heaven, and that the work that may be done may be done for His glory and, and the glory of God. Uh, and that everything that I do, and if you're drawn to the Lord, it, you're the fruit of my labor. And I just do this that God may uh, be glorified and that the Lord may say to me one day, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, before I get started with any Bible study, I always like to begin with prayer. That way you can know the intent of my heart and my thoughts. So let's get started. If you could bear, bow, bow your head and join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you today thanking you for all that you have done for us and, and also for that which you've denied. For every decision that you decide to do, O oh God, is a perfect decision. Father, I pray that as you have taught me that through your Holy Spirit, uh, I pray that the message and, and the warning and the evidence that you have shown, I may show with clear teaching, Father. I pray also that you may forgive us for any sins that we have done knowing that your son shed his blood willingly, that it please you for, this, for the uh, uh, renewal of us and, and the forgiveness of sins and the restoration of us, that we may have a, a fellowship and, and be called into, into your arms, O oh God, being called brother, sons and daughters of the Lord. And we thank you so much for the salvation that the Lamb had uh, placed himself on the cross, and we, we thank you so much for that, O oh Lord, so for forgiving us for anything we've done in thought and, and in deed. I pray also, Lord, that this work may be uh, for your kingdom's sake. Let the Son be glorified through this Holy Spirit, that all that, that everything be done here, that Christ be increased and in, in not myself. And I pray that the message and the, and the wisdom that you have given me that I share with all who looks at this ministry and all who looks at this study may come to know you more and seek out more wisdom from you and learning from your, learning from your Holy Spirit, greater things that I could ever teach. I pray, Father, that any unbeliever may come to know Christ through this ministry, and believers may also may come to be edified, comfort, and exhort the Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so with this study, um, I'm going to tell you, folks, this particular message I'm going to speak here is so heavy in my heart that I feel that if I, if I fail to say anything, that I'll be held in contempt. In a sense that I will be doing the Lord a disservice in what he has shown me for the church and not seeing anything. It's so important that I say I, I, I speak about this. So what we're going to talk about today is the approaching first seal. I know it's heavy. I know that you're probably like, what are you even talking about the first seal? When I'm talking about the first seal, folks, I'm talking about the first seal in Revelation 6, where it talks about, behold, the pale horse. I mean, it talks about the, a, a horse. Uh, when the first seal is broken, there was a white horse, and he who sat on it had a crown. Now, for so many years and for so long, even myself, before I let the Holy Spirit teach me, I was always put upon this path to think that the white horse is something spiritual, and then the second horse is something spiritual, and the third horse is something spiritual, and so on and so on and so on. I always kind of regurgitated what everyone else was saying and without letting the Holy Spirit just teach it to me. And, f <clears throat> and folks, let me tell you, excuse me, I got to get some water real quick. <clears throat> But let me tell you, the Lord is faithful. But first, before I even get into what I want to explain about this horse, is this. To kind of give you a uh, clear understanding of where the Holy Spirit is leading us with this study. Do you remember the story of um, Judas? How he was a disciple. He was one that the Lord picked, one of the twelve, original twelve, in which he later on portrayed him. Now, Judas was prophesied to do what he was going to do, portray the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. He was, the, he was going to portray him, one of his own. But here's the thing. Judas did not portray the Lord until the appointed time, until there was a time designated for him to do what he was supposed to do. But, there, but, 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 but before he portrayed the Lord, he met the Lord. They had met at one point in time. And when they met at that one point in time where he was the disciple, three years later, he fulfilled his purpose in portraying the Lord. 
In fact, at the Last Supper, remember when they said, see who is the one who's going to betray him. And then Jesus takes it, dips it. <clears throat> dips the bread in the sauce and gives it to him and then Satan enters Judas body and Jesus says to him go and what you're going to do do it quickly and then that's when we're in the garden and the next part of the story where we see that the, uh, the mob comes and Judas goes and kiss Jesus on the cheek fulfilling the prophecy of what Judas was going to do but before Judas did what he was going to do Jesus and Ju Jesus and Judas had met at one point in time they met they fellowship, they knew one another, and then that's when he fulfilled his purpose. So do you understand that, folks? That even though Judas was prophesied to do what he's going to do, they didn't, he didn't betray the Lord, kiss him on the cheek as soon as he said, follow me. Jesus didn't he'll say, you're going to be my disciple. Okay, I'm Judas. I'm going to be your disciples. Let me kiss you, betray you. It didn't happen like that immediately. They met. They had a time period where they fellowship together. Then at God's appointed time, that's when he fulfilled his purpose. Now, looking at this image here of the white horse and the conqueror that sits on him, I believe what's happening here is that we're about to see this white horse meet the conqueror who's going to sit on him. Just like how Judas met Jesus for the first time, we're about, we are approaching when this white horse is going to meet this uh, conqueror is going to settle him. The conqueror is the Antichrist, just like how Pope Francis is the white horse. These are two individual people. You got to remember, folks, when you're seeing the vision and the imagery as the Holy Spirit portrays it, you cannot intellectually understand it or try to intellectually comprehend it. You must see how he, the Lord, sees things. We must put ourselves in the Spirit to be able to see how the Spirit sees things. We can't see things, oh yeah, the white horse. Oh, that means that's when all things are going to happen and there's going to be a certain person that's just going to do one thing. No, these are two individual people. The white horse is someone, the conqueror is someone. Do you understand that? And here's something to kind of bring you, bring it, bring it around again, to really understand the depth of what I'm about to say here. Remember the story when Jesus came to the city riding in on a donkey? Well, again, that was a prophecy where he would ride into the city on a donkey. And he fulfilled it, ride into the city on a donkey. But I went, and the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, I really ne never ever paid attention to this, folks. Really, never paid attention to it. But the Holy Spirit just guided me here with this particular passage. And when I read it, I'm like... That makes perfect sense with what's happening right now. A prop. This pertains to a prophecy. It wasn't like the disciples were like, "Oh, master rides into city on donkey." It didn't happen like that. It was a prophecy in which the king of Israel, the Messiah, would ride in a city on donkey. That was a prophecy. So when it happened, it was taken note of. And again, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we are seeing these two individual people, the white horse and the conqueror, about to meet. And when you look at this passage I'm about to show you, you're either going to see it or, or you're going to see it before it happens or, you're gonna, or the Holy Spirit is going to bring it to your remembrance after it happens. Watch this. So in this prophecy, the, the, the Messiah will ride into the city on a donkey, right? And this goes in John chapter 12, right? Watch 12 through 19. The next day, a great multitude that had come into the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it was written, Fear not, daughters of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a colt. That's what it was written. That was the prophecy where it says, as it was written, Fear not, daughters of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Watch this. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, here we go. When Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him, that they had done these things to him. So his disciples did not understand these things at first. First, folks, let me finish reading it too so I can be, so if you need to test the spirit, you know I'm reading everything. I'm not trying to paraphrase anything. <clears throat> but when his, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered. So we're saying after the fact, then they remembered that these things were written about him, that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him called, called when who were with him 
when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him, because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said to themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So the point I'm making with this passage is this. We ha there is a prophecy. There was a prophecy that the disciples knew. But when it was moving into place, they did not understand it. After the fact, when it had been fulfilled, then they understood it. There was a prophecy, but when it was moving into place, the disciples did not understand it until after the fact, then they remembered the scriptures in the prophecy as it's been fulfilled. Going right back to what I'm saying here, we see the prophecy of Revelation 6. Which, uh, one through one through three, I believe. Behold, there was a pale horse, and he who sat in was a conqueror, and a conqueror was given to him a king. A conqueror was given to him a crown, and a bow was in his hand, and he went out conquering to conquer. That is what's written. What I'm trying, what I'm going to show you today is we are watching it move into place, just like the disciples went to go get the cult, the donkey's cult. They saw it move into place but didn't put two and two together until after the fact where they then realize this prophecy has been fulfilled which if you don't catch this you're going to figure it out after the fact when it's too late well not too late in a sense that it's too late for us but just after the fact so when you see this and again as i told you that the white horse and the conqueror are two different people here's the scriptures to support this this is not speculation this is, the scriptures are consistent what it says once it's going to say again and it's going to say again it's consistent watching revelation 19 again the white horse is pope francis the one who sits on him is the antichrist but these are two individual people so watch this and here's the evidence of it and revelation 19 says and i saw the beast the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him this is when christ returns okay uh make war against him who sat on his who sat on the horse and against his army and then the beast number one was captured and with him the false prophet number two who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped the image. These two, these two, which these two? The beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. One, two, these two. Consistent. These two are cast alive into the lake of fire, burn them with fire and brimstone. Um, excuse me, these two are uh, cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So we see a consistency again. One, two, beast, false prophet. These two. So and just and it correlates perfectly with conqueror, white horse, beast, false prophet. Let's see where it says it again. Daniel speaks of end times, and in, well, uh, in Daniel chapter two, verse forty-one to forty-two. Let's see what it says there. Whereas you saw, of course, you give you a backstory. If this is the first time you see it, you know the Daniel statue where there's a golden head, uh, arms and chest of silver, waist of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay, which depicts basically the human existence from the Babylonian Empire, which was the gold, to the Medes and Persians of silver, to the waste, which is of the Greeks' empire led by Alexander the Great. When the Roman Empire, well, Alexander the Great's kingdom fractured, broken, which were led by four of his generals, became to became one, which became the Roman Empire. Empire. Roman Empire then fractured between the East and West Roman Empire. That's how you have the legs. That's where we are right here. The legs, East and West Roman Empire, which then split into, sorry, which then split into uh, where we have the ten toes uh, mixed with iron and clay. And this, and Daniel speaks at this era of time right here. He says, whereas you saw the feet of partly, where you saw the feet of ten toes, partly of potter's clay, one, and partly of iron, Two, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. So you see again a partnership here. 
You see a partnership. And again, this correlates perfectly with what we just saw where we said the white horse, the, the white horse and the conqueror, and which correlates with what we just read a second ago with the false prophet and the beast, which correlates here perfectly again with the potter's clay or the clay and the iron. We see this merging of the two, this fusion of the two, this partnership of the two, which then goes to, again, a n perfect correlation with end, times, with end time prophecy and the two world leaders that's going to come. Revelation 13. Then I John is talking about the world powers here. Then I stood in, on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Number one, a beast coming out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and his horns had ten crowns, and on his head was blasphemous name. So we see first a beast coming out the sea. And you see that previously uh, we noticed that with the image, and this is in Revelation 13. In Revelation 17, there is an image of a harlot who sat on this beast. So we see the harlot sat on this beast, but we see on Revelation, we're going to see a conqueror sit on a white horse. You see how the Holy Spirit gives visions of how he interprets things? It's not like, well, why didn't the Holy Spirit do this? Well, you're not the Holy Spirit that hovered above the waters over the creation of the planet. So you're not going to have the type of perception of things that that pertains to our world and our time and peoples and countries as the holy spirit is so as god is showing through his holy spirit the visions of these beasts we see a beast here where there was a woman that sat on it we see revelation there was a horse where congress sets on it now we're seeing in this instance a beast that comes out the sea so let's see again there's another beast that comes out the earth it's consistent in Revelation 13. Uh, then I saw another beast that coming out the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So you see this consistent partnership over and over and over and over again. I'm going to wrap it up for you once more. You have the conqueror on a white horse. Then you have the feet of iron and the feet of clay. And then you have the uh, beast coming out the sea, the beast coming out the earth. And then you have finally Revelation 6, where I just said, you behold, you come and see and look. And there was a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. He went on a car. car. So this you can see again, this partnership, 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 partnership. That's why when anyone ever tells you that this image here of this person on the white horse, this white horse is just symbolic for something or it's spiritual for something. No, this is an image of two individual people. That's what this is. Two individual people, because we just read a bunch of scriptures that said it. Pope, I mean, the false prophet and the beast. Now, who is the person that's going to ride on top of this power to go conquer and conquer? Where scripture tells us that it's this person called the Assyrian, the false prophet. We already have done scripture about, you look at my Bible studies, it tells you time and time and time and time again that Pope Francis is the false prophet. He is the white horse. And the perfect perfect way in which this, uh, the Holy Spirit gives John this vision because you have Pope Francis is going to get the power of these ten kings with the power of these ten kings this person is going to ride on top of him or use his military might to go conquer and we want to know who what, what about the conqueror what does the conqueror do well here's what Isaiah says about this conqueror we see, therefore, in Isaiah 10, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian he shall strike you with a rod and lift you up. Will he strike you with what? A rod. So this Assyrian has a rod and a scripture will tell you of iron. And the rod is a weapon being used just like the conqueror is using the horse. This Assyrian is using a rod. So he says he shall strike you with a rod and lift you, lift his staff, rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. Then you have another scripture in Isaiah 14, uh, that I will break the Assyrian in my land. The land he's talking about is Israel. And on my mountains tread on him underfoot, then his yoke shall be removed from him and his burden removed from their shoulders. And then we have Micaiah. It says, they shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod and all its entrance. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. So you, we see this consistency of this Assyrian that's going to be in the land of Israel. This Assyrian, this Assyrian, this Assyrian. So when you look at this Assyrian that's going to be in Israel at the end times, 
Well, what is he going to do? Well, Jesus tells you some of the things that he's going to do. You go to Matthew 24. Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, so that's another name for the Caesarean is abomination of desolation, spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Where is the holy place? Israel. Whoever reads, let him understand. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go back to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there would be much great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake those days will be shortened. So we see that this, uh, as we just read with Isaiah, and correlating to more detail with what Jesus is saying, that this person is called the abomination, the desolation, will be in Israel, in the holy place of the temple, which is going to be built. But when you see, and when look what Jesus says too, spoken by who? Spoken by Daniel the prophet. So then let's just follow what Jesus says. Let's go to Daniel the prophet and see what he said. Daniel the prophet. One thing he mentions about this end time ruler that's going to come to Israel is this. Daniel 11. At the time of the end, the king of the south, which is known as Egypt, shall attack him. And the king of the north, Syria, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, a horseman with many ships. And shall enter countries, overwhelm and pass through. So this conqueror that we just read in Revelation 6, that goes out conquering, fits perfectly with what we just read now. Not only is he going to be getting into Israel and getting into Israel's, as far as the, where the temple of Israel is, the capital of Jerusalem, this person is going to be conquering so much. He's going to be going up against Egypt as well. And then as he's going against Egypt as well, he says here, uh, he shall enter the countries, he shall enter countries, overwhelm them and pass through. And in addition to these other countries that he's going to overwhelm, and, and, and then aside from Egypt and these other countries, he's also going to go into these glorious lands. And many countries shall be overthrown. And But now watch this. As he says, the countries go into the glorious land of Israel, and then many countries shall be overthrown. It fits perfectly when, when Jesus was talking about a nation, nation shall rally against nation, kingdom against kingdom. You see that? It just correlates perfectly. But watch this, folks. Now, this is what we're talking about here. This is the whole point of study. Pay attention. All right? I don't want to lose you. As he's conquering all these surrounding countries, as he's conquering nations and, and, and kingdoms and Egypt and Israel and Jerusalem, guess who doesn't get touched? Guess who just conveniently just goes right past them? But these shall escape his hand. Edom Moab and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against these countries. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopia shall also fall on his heels, but news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. So this massive military campaign that this person is going to do, this conqueror is going to do, conquering many countries, as it says here, conquering many countries. He shall enter these countries, overwhelm these countries, enter the glorious land, go attack Egypt. But can, for some strange reason, he's just going to pass Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Now, why is that? Well, let's check it out. Here's an old map of the Assyrian Empire back in biblical times, Old Testament times. Here is the kingdom of Edom. Here's the kingdom of Moab. And here's the kingdom of Ammon. These three countries here are the countries in which are not going to, uh, which are going to escape this person's military campaign. He's just going to avoid touching these three countries here. Everyone else, Egypt, which is all the way back here, uh, and the surrounding country, many countries, uh, we could just keep going on and on. But these three countries just doesn't get touched. Now, if you put that on a map today and you see, well, where do they stand? Well, here's a present map with Amman, Moab, and Edom. And as you see, it's just simply just take these three countries, put them on a current map. And what you see today is the present kingdom of Jordan. 
That's what you're seeing, the kingdom of Jordan. So we're seeing scriptures saying that aside from Israel and aside from Egypt and whatever country surrounding this uh, this mil this person's military campaign that's going to be that's going to be conquering, he's not going to touch the kingdom of Jordan. Yes. Jordan is not just the country called Jordan. Jordan is technically called the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. It's ruled by a king. It's a monarchy, kind of like the United Kingdom in England. It has a head of state. Uh, its its head of state is a king, not a president. No one's elected. It's a king that rules this country. It's the Kingdom of Jordan. Now, knowing that Pope Francis is the white horse, knowing that Pope Francis fulfills Revelation 17 to the T, knowing that he's the eighth beast, knowing that he is the false prophet, guess where he's going this weekend, folks? Guess where he's going to stop by on his first trip outside of Rome towards the Middle East? Guess where he's going? He's going to Jordan. He's going to go to Jordan, and he's going to go to Israel, including the West Bank. We see scripture tells about a Jordanian ruler, a Jordanian who's going to be uh, uh, going about conquering all of the Middle East and Israel, sitting on a person that's known as the White Horse, and we seeing Pope Francis, who's going to this very place, Jordan. In Israel where the it's going to be the epicenter of end time prophecy are you guys watching are you guys watching <sighs> what this means folks is just like what I said before and that is that donkey the Jesus asked his disciples or commanded his disciples to go get the donkeys called they knew about the prophecy they were in the mix of getting it as the Lord had commanded but they did not even see what was really going on until after it had been fulfilled we're seeing Pope Francis right now he is that white horse he's about to go to Jordan where this conqueror is going to be where he's going to come from that's why he's not going to attack Edom, Moed, and Amman it's because that's the country where he's from now because of that the only thing we're waiting for after this merger happens is for him to meet a Jordanian prince who wants to be king. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. We're going to meet these two individuals, just like how when the disciples went to go get the donkey, when it was time for Jesus to sit on it. And we're about to see the Pope Francis, who's this horse, and he's about to meet the guy that's going to ride him. And this person's going to want to become king, which will set the first seal in motion. Whereas once it's broken, then he sits on the power of Pope Francis after he gets the ten kings. And a crown is given to him. He's coronated. A crown is given him, and he goes out to conquer. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to build a kingdom. This Assyrian is trying to rebuild, it seems, the Assyrian Empire. He wants to build a kingdom for himself. And where we're going to, after this weekend, folks, I'm not even prepared about, oh my goodness, I'm not even prepared what's about to go down this weekend. But none, nonetheless, folks, please watch for Pope Francis to meet with some Jordanian prince, Jordanian prince that the world is going to love, who's favored by the world. That's the thing. That's the, that's the deception. And just think about this, folks. How many places of this world, look at this. I just got to bring this up. How many places here, right, in the Middle East has conflict? Iraq has conflict. Syria definitely has conflict. Lebanon with Hezbollah and, and you have um, Israel with those, his neighbors and the, the Gaza Strip. Egypt is just Oh, they're trying to get themselves together, which means that a king has to come from Egypt. Remember, this Antichrist, this conqueror is going to fight with the king of the south. There is no king there yet, but it has to be a person who's going to be king. So we're seeing that. But you see, just basically, this entire region over here has just got issues. And then Saudi Arabia is, is warring with its southern neighbor in Yemen. 
So you see, just the surrounding regions are in conflict. And what's the country that just seemed to be just bypassing bullets left and right, like Neo from the Matrix? Jordan. You think that's an accident? No, not at all. Not at all. The very country that's going to try to initiate peace in the Middle East would be the very country that is having peace, that is peaceful. And that's Jordan. No wonder why the Antichrist will go, in, will go there and, and, and promise Israel a seven-year peace treaty. Of course, because obviously Jordan's doing something right because they're not warring with anybody. Syria is, Iraq is in chaos, all on the coastline in the Mediterranean. Israel, of course, Egypt can't get themselves, but yet Jordan, why is that? Because we see the Assyrian, and the, who's the conqueror, comes from Jordan, folks. So please, watch out for this day. Watch out this weekend. This is going to be this weekend, and that is the week of the 24th to the 26th. Pay attention. Pay attention. Watch. Watch, folks. And whatever happens then... If he meets with some Jordanian prince who's going to be this little horn, you remember scripture called him little horn? Reason is a little horn, it's a little man. It's going to be a little, a little, a little king because all the ten horns are kings. The ten horns, Revelation says, the ten horns are ten kings. Well, if there's a little horn among them, then there's a little king among them. It's a little guy, it's a short man. It's so much is happening, guys. So watch out for this pope to meet a Jordanian prince who's a short man who will want to establish a confederacy or promote some idea of the Middle East becoming one, which will then might which will then eventually move this closer and closer and closer into fulfillment. But Pope Francis doesn't have the Ten Kings yet. And that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for these last two queens to get rid, to, to abdicate, to be replaced by kings. But once those kings are replaced and the following way happens and whew, just so much is happening, folks. Just please pay attention. I hope you're watching because I am. And if you're not, I'm telling you. So I love you all. This is a short, brief Bible study. Just pay attention. And uh, I pray that you might be able to be moved by this. Please share this with believers. Just bring it to their attention. Just tell them to watch this. I explain it all. And when after this weekend comes, we'll see what the Lord shows us. <clears throat> And when it moves in fulfillment, once it is, once he uh, will be, and uh, oh, here's the, here's the blessing too, folks. Thank you. Here's the blessing too, folks. Once this pope, once this conqueror sits on Pope Francis, it will all make sense. It will all make sense. Just like for the donkeys, when, when those disciples went to go get the donkey and they didn't realize what, they, what was going on, how they were watching it just right in front of them. And then after Jesus sat on it and went into the city and the scripture was fulfilled, it clicked. The Holy Spirit brought it to the remembrance. Oh, you're going to know. You're going to know. Have no doubt. But just what blessing is it to see it before it happens so you know what era of time you're in? Amen? Getting hyped. So, um, you guys, if you want to... Uh, uh, get at me on uh, Google Plus. I'm Watch W Watchman Brooks. You can catch me there. Uh, Facebook Watchman Ministry. Please uh, leave me a message. Uh, share this. Um, pray. Pray for this ministry. Pray for me. And and watch, folks. That's the job and duty we've been tasked to do. Remember, Paul wrote in First or Second Timothy. He, he said uh, the three things, the three good occupations to study from regarding strength is. One like a soldier, one who's like an athlete, another one's like a farmer. And with a with a with a soldier, they watch their enemy. And with uh, an athlete, they watch their opponent. And with a farmer, they watch those who wants to steal their crops. So pay attention to that, folks. I love you all. God bless you all. Good night.